Two men look out the same prison bars. One sees the mud, and one the stars. Well, here I finally am with the video I teased back in my Jojo Leon Chapter 110 video, going over all the Jojo parts and giving them a comprehensive ranking. It took quite some time, mainly because, well, laziness took over. But also, I put in quite a number of hours into revisiting the previous Jojo parts, both manga and anime, to take all points into account, even though at this point, I have so many chapters memorized down to the small style box. But at last, here I am. I'll be looking at them by compositing both the manga and anime versions as best as I can. Jojo parts can be quite divisive because of their inherent nature. Each part has their own unique feel, some being more straightforward battle story, while others Castlevania. Some have a mafia feel, while others are westerns. You could almost call them separate series with a few recurring characters, all the more reason why I feel this series still feels fresh to this day. I would also like to say that this tier list? Wrong. Every single Jojo part is far above S for me, and that's final. If you picked a random Jojo part and told me to go back to it, I wouldn't have any trouble doing so. When I feel bored, I can just pull up any part from 1 to 8 and end up reading through almost its entirety. However, some parts I come back to more often than others, and that's where this tier list will split. So without further ado... Phantom Blood tends to be the most overlooked part of Jojo. When people recommend Jojo, even hardcore fans often say, oh, skip Phantom Blood, doesn't matter, just get to part 2. Or else, skip right to part 3 since that's where things get real. And I can see why some might say that. Phantom Blood is a very simplistic part. It has a clear hero and a clear bad guy, and you can absolutely find that boring. I've seen plenty of people dismiss Jonathan Joestar as this bland hunk of muscle, a generic good guy. Yet, at the same time, I find there's merit in that simplicity. Simple doesn't equal bad. As long as the characters are still compelling or the world is interesting, the story can still work despite its basic nature. After all, when you break down the plot of something like John Wick, it's a very basic revenge story. Yet the nuance behind his characters and surprisingly deep lore is what appeals to so many people. Phantom Blood's hero defeat the villain structure is elevated by its actual fights and powers, as well as the relationship between his hero and villain. It's the most interesting part of the story. In fact, compared to the other Jojo parts, part 1 is the only one that sets up its protagonist antagonist relationship right at the beginning. Jonathan and Dio's childhood together creates a bond between them that is definitely not brotherhood but isn't complete adversity either. That is what ties Phantom Blood together and why it's stuck to the end to see the resolution to that relationship. Jonathan may not develop much, but his appeal comes from elsewhere, his unwavering heart and resolve. It might not make for the most complex character, but still he manages to draw me in with that unflinchingly gentlemanly attitude. To the point where, after he defeats his arch nemesis Dio, he sheds a tear. And really, isn't there a place for a protagonist like that? Who are just good and keep being good even to their last breath. He's not my favorite Jojo, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't want to see more of him. All in all, it's not my favorite part by any means, but it's a part that actually feels unique in its simplicity. And I can definitely appreciate that. It definitely feels different compared to the rest of Jojo. The bombastic, quirky energy is significantly toned down here, opting for a more serious, gothic story with occasional philosophical questions about bread. And then came part two. You know the people I mentioned, the ones that just say skip to part 3. Don't listen to them. Battle Tendency is absolutely worth checking out for a whole host of reasons. First off, there's a protagonist, Joseph Joestar. I love everything about him, from his personality to his tactics, which remains light and funny usually, but definitely has that fiery spirit Jonathan had. I've always had the fondness for those trickster characters, using all sorts of unexpected means to gain the upper hand against impossible odds. Those means include Hamon as well, which I often see cast aside in the face of stands. I know this was a thing in part 1 too, but Battle Tendency shows how creative Araki he could be with it. It has different polarities, it can be conducted through various objects, it can be infused into tools to turn them into weapons like clackers or even bubbles. I suppose Caesar is a Sailor Mercury fan. This also leads to incredibly fun fights that are more rife with zany energy that Jojo fans are more comfortable with. In fact, I'd say Battle Tendency is the funniest of all parts half that thanks to Joseph. It's all great, except for its beginning. It is a blast seeing Joseph rush against time to grow strong enough to defeat the Pillarmen, and even forming a respectful rivalry with one that is one of my favorite fights in Jojo. Yet everything leading up to it feels strangely boring. 
With the anime, it's the first four episodes of the part two. It just feels like it takes too long to start up. I get that it has to escalate somehow, but I still find myself skimming over that part of the story when I reread it. Still, Battle Tendency is arguably where Jojo start to feel more like Jojo. Its general tone, character quirks, the bombastic nature. Of course, a majority of Jojo fans would disagree, as they point instead to the series' next part, Stardust Crusaders. No one can deny the popularity of this part. Even to this day, when most people hear Jojo, they probably think first of part 3, of the <laughs> and the <laughs> it's the part that produced the most memes too. The general consensus seems to be that stands are an amazing concept, the part's one of the best, but Jotaro is a bit bland. I only agree with one and half of that statement. Firstly, stands are absolutely genius. I could probably make a whole video on why stands work as a concept, and I probably will. It brings a new level of creativity and wackiness to fights that are just fun to watch. It could be a car chase or a card game, a dream sequence, or oh, that's a baseball. However. To say Jotaro is boring wouldn't be correct, it's a case similar to Jonathan really. He may be a simple character, but that doesn't make him a bad character. He's a guy that seems like an unflappable badass all the time, but in reality has a conviction burning inside of him, as we see when he reveals what he thinks is true evil. And it's those moments, those scenes where we see through the rough exterior, those are what humanizes Jotaro as more than just a badass who punches. You can absolutely say other cast members are more interesting, but to say Jotaro is just bland would be a misinterpretation. Interpretation. So that all seems great, right? The fights are better than ever, the main Jojo is compelling, all the stuff that should make for a memorable part from beginning to end. It's not that simple. Stardust Crusaders has a crucial problem. It drags. The actual part of part 3 is fairly simple, actually reminded me a lot of part 1. The hero goes on a quest with newfound power to stop a villain tied to his family. The difference is that Phantom Blood was short, just 44 chapters. Therefore, its simple nature could work, keeping the pace brisk and not letting things go stale. Stardust Crusaders is 152 chapters long, almost quadrupled the part 1's length. Yet because the structure remains just as plain, the endless stream of villains of the week start to meander. This is even worse in the anime, where almost all stand battles get two full episodes. Because of this, when I go back to reread Jojo, part 3 is the only one where I read in short increments. All the other parts are in of reading through more than half of it, sometimes all. Yet with part 3, I'd pick a specific arc, read it, and a couple more beyond, and then put it down. The pacing is just flaccid. It's very enjoyable in shorter bursts, but to go through the entire story is more exhausting than any other JoJo part. I don't harbor the same love for Stardust Crusaders as so many do. I still like it as I do all JoJo parts, but it's clear that it's still very basic, trying to test out how to write stand battle after stand battle into an engaging story. Which is why I'm so glad for Diamond is Unbreakable. Duang takes a very stark contrast to previous action-oriented Jojo parts. The previous Dio trilogy, if you will, were grandiose about quests that spanned over multiple towns and countries for the fate of the world. To say part 4 narrows it down would be an even bigger understatement than Dio's ego. And I love this change of pace. I love this new, bright, urban fantasy style story, where stand battles are not just simple fights, but part of events that happen in this crazy, noisy, bizarre town. Now, some encounters are not even fights, and yet they are more entertaining than the Star Crusaders facing yet another tarot card villain. The episodic nature works to capture the fact that we are seeing just the great days in Moriocho. Stand powers have gotten a bit more complex and more specific. This leads to more complicated clashes that are still easily digestible. They're far lighter in tone like the part as a whole, but they still manage to pull you in through relatively serious situations within that frame. For instance, the whole harvest encounter is because a few kids got greedy about pocket change. Who can't relate to that? Topping it all off is a fantastic villain that fits the overall theme of the part perfectly. Actually, I haven't mentioned the villains much. I was scripting this video and I realized I was talking about the villains almost as much as the part itself, so I decided I should maybe section it off into another tier video. After all, maybe a part that I like has a villain I don't like, and vice versa. But long story short, Kira Yoshikage is one of my favorite villains in fiction, period. 
The only issue I take is its third half. The story feels more like padding, like Araki is stalling until he finally draws the final fight. I see this as the overall tone of the part clashing with the story's escalation. At this point, we fully know that Kira is out there, he now knows the heroes and will kill again. Yet, instead of narrowing the focus on the process of fighting Kira, the story still opts for the crazy, noisy, and bizarre encounters that don't tie in well to the newfound urgency. Thankfully, the anime rectifies this a lot, where it puts three stand battles and one Kira story in four episodes. But still, Diamond's The Breakable is still one of my favorite JoJo parts. It's fun, it's heartwarming, it's sometimes scary, it's JoJo. According to Rocky, this is where JoJo he thought of ends. And after that is Vento Audio. AKA the part where the fashion really start to go bizarre. Look, full disclosure, I prefer pink Giorno to blue Giorno. It's just a far more interesting color, you know? Vento Audio is a part quite different from Diamond's The Breakable, that much should be very obvious. It takes a more Starter's Crusaders style approach, where the heroes move from place to place while fighting off that week's villain. However, part 5 is paced so much better. For one, there are the villains. They often show camaraderie, genuine friendship, and care for each other, and sometimes even... So they are far more interesting to see. Not to mention, the stand battles are flat out some of the best in the series. There's just something about these abilities that makes them so memorable and fascinating to watch. This, coupled with the far bloodier tone, makes for some seriously intense matches no holes barred, like the White Album fight, the King Crimson vs Metallica fight, or the Green Day fight. Also, the story is split into sections where the plot changes, giving a far more dynamic feel. Initially, it's about Giorno joining the gang, and then it's escorting the boss's daughter, and after that, it's finally about defeating the boss. This change in thesis means that the characters get to stay dynamic too, as their motivations and thoughts develop accordingly. It is only when it gets to the climax to where the story falters. Now, I do like how it tried to be a bit different from just a fight, introducing a mysterious X-Factor of Requiem into the mix and making it more of a game of capture the flag with the stand arrow. But there are two issues to this. One is that this sudden focus on Silver Cherry Requiem means the actual final boss suffers heavily. Again, I'll elaborate more in my villains video, but this whole Requiem business eats up most of the finale. When the finale is where the main villain should get to shine the most, it leaves you with a very empty impression of Diablo. Not to mention, let's admit it, Requiem sort of comes out of nowhere. I know stand arrow theories have sprung up to defend it, but honestly, do you really think Araki had to plan all out from the beginning? Even a JoJo fan like me has to face that. And being slightly cynical here, it feels like Araki couldn't think of a way for the heroes to be King Crimson, so he came up with a last minute power up. Now, to be fair, it still manages to be thematically relevant, and I wouldn't call this finale bad by any means, but it's certainly lacking. I mean, in the anime, you can see the budget cuts were made for most of the Silver Cherry Requiem deal. I think that means something. Still, everything up to that point is absolutely gripping, and I consider it very fondly. I find a lot of people are split on this part, but I myself am firmly in the camp of loving it. Though I'd say Vento Audio still has it easy compared to... Uh, Stone Ocean. <laughs> I said that Phantom Blood is often the most overlooked part, but Stone Ocean I say gets maligned just as much. It is easily the most divisive part in the entire series, and for a while it was even up for debate whether they'd actually make an anime for it. Thankfully it is now a reality so the memes can now start tormenting Part 7 fans. A lot of people don't like Stone Ocean for a myriad of reasons. It's even bloodier and grittier than Vento Audio, a natural progression when your story takes place in jail. Scenes often veer into the grotesque, and it's definitely not recommended for the squeamish. Stand abilities have gotten even more complicated, to the point where a minor villain stand has gained infamy on almost the same level as King Crimson. The main character's stand ability seems less powerful compared to, say, creating life. Its atmosphere is heavy, oppressive, bearing down on you and on Kujo Jorin. Yet all the things I just said, I see them all as positives. Sure, it's rather heavy and some might be turned off by that, but I absolutely love the grimy, gritty atmosphere it's got going through its entirety. The stands are complex, yes, but at the same time, I love the creativity put on display here. I also love Stone Free. It might not be as flashy as past JoJo fans, but its simplicity and creative uses lead to very interesting visuals during fights. 
Honestly, I can't really find much wrong with the part. It's different, yes, but so are all the past parts too. I can understand that it's not their taste, but I find Stone Ocean to be criminally underrated among the JoJo parts. And then there's the ending, probably the biggest factor in why people are split on Stone Ocean. I won't spoil it, but I personally love it. It's a very bittersweet ending, but it directly refutes the main villain's philosophy, turning it around on him. It also shows that what truly matters is not the main JoJo, but the spirit they inspire in others. The only criticism I can fully levy at it is its art, more specifically the black and white manga art. I haven't mentioned the art style much, since I just think they all complement their respective parts very well. Stone Ocean is the same. For the most part. I don't know if it's the more realistic art style, or the black and white, or the abundance of detail lines, but a lot of times, coupled with the more complex stand powers, it is excruciatingly difficult to follow what's happening in the panels. I only understood it after I read the colored version. However, I feel this will soon become a non-issue with the anime adaptation. I don't think I need to explain why having things in color and in motion will help massively with understanding. Considering how Vento Audio anime made King Crimson infinitely more understandable, I have faith in the upcoming anime. Now moving on to the non-animated stuff, Steel Ball Run. I love it, I love everything about it, it's absolutely amazing, and that's all I have to say about it. Okay, no, I have more to say about it. First off, oh my god, it's art style. Every art style fits its part, but Steel Ball Run especially works. There's just something about the realistic art, sort of remind me of old American portraits you see in history books, that synergizes well with the almost western feel of the part. It's far cleaner, allowing you to soak in its gorgeous wide shots, whether in monochrome or in color. The country spanning feels quite reminiscent of Stardust Crusaders, but there are notable additions here to make the pacing feel better. For one, it's not just fighting off the weekly villains, but also hunting for body parts of this completely mysterious unknown holy figure from the past that you will never guess who he is. This quest actively shakes up the story as we get a treasure hunt across the US, making each new encounter fun as they have to concern themselves with both a new villain and a new course part. Steel Ball Run also benefits from a narrowing of focus on its main cast. Now, previous groups were great, don't get me wrong, but it's nice to see a more focused duo, like in parts 1 and 2. At the same time, it builds other prominent characters too, but more as rivals or situational antagonists. It has various other characters all gunning for the course part, and it's their crossovers that create the conflicts and interesting dynamics. It makes things less black and white, and I find that complexity wonderful. Stand abilities have actually gotten simpler compared to the previous part. Rocky once said that since these characters have simpler minds, mindsets, they will have simpler powers. The escalation in stand complexity seemed to reflect the part's era, and how much average knowledge has expanded with academic development. And these simpler stands allow for fights that are easier to understand, but are just as much fun, especially the final battle against the president. Funny Valentine is another contender for one of my favorite main villains in JoJo. His conviction is what creates an antagonist that is less physically unstoppable than he is mentally. It's actually the same thing that made the previous parts Enrico Pucci a great villain, but even better thanks to essential ideals, actually reminiscent of Imperial Nation's philosophies. I really cannot think of anything wrong with this part. It has everything down from a great plot, characters, and that extra bit of insanity that makes Jojo… well, Jojo. Anyone who doesn't think Gyro is funny deserves to… have their own opinion. Comedy is subjective after all. And last but certainly not least, Jolion. I've gone into this already in my chapter 110 video, but in brief, Josuke is a great Jojo, the story can stumble a bit with mystery and unanswered plot points, but they are nowhere near enough to bring down the central plot. The final boss is rather weak, but still serviceable, and Josuke Yasuo couple is the absolute sweetest. But again, even the lowest part is still far above great for me. I mean, I really don't have any trouble picking it back up no matter what, even though I've read it enough times to memorize every punch in the 7 page muda. Who knows where part 9 will fit into all of this. But after all these years, my faith in the Rocky has only grown stronger. I have no doubt that, if nothing else, Jojo will continue being bizarre.